Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So, it's a great pleasure to have, uh, to have you with Scott Aronson from MIT. Scott is a uh, leader in research in uh, quantum computing. He's uh, won the uh, NSF uh, Waterman uh, Award for a um, top uh, young scientist. And has a very popular blog and has recently written a book which uh, <laughs> It's available <laughs> and has been compared by Seth Lloyd to an open brain surgery, I think. Uh, but I think he meant it as a compliment. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, uh, so, so thank you so much, Boaz. Uh, it is always wonderful to have an excuse to uh, make the long journey uh, down the road from, uh, from MIT to come uh, uh, visit here. So, uh, uh, okay. So, so. Actually, you know, I've spoken here tw uh, twice before about uh, sort of more, you know, specific technical things. But uh, 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 since this was the, the colloquium, I thought that uh, I would give sort of a, a more general talk uh, about, you know, uh, something that's been on my mind lately, which is, uh, um, you know, uh, so you think quantum computing is bunk. Uh, so, uh, so, um, all right. So, 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 so let me start by just, you know, uh, uh, reviewing some some basics about quantum computing. I'm sure you know some of you know this stuff. Uh, you know, and then I'm going to uh, talk about okay, you know, what what would it take sort of to make quantum computing not work, to make it fail for some fundamental physical reason, and you know, is that a, a serious possibility that, that 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 we should be considering? Okay, so um, sorry. Uh, when I did a, a Google image search for quantum computer, uh, this was one of the first things that came up. That's apparently what they look like. Uh, so, you know, I'm, as you can probably tell, I'm a theorist. I'm not an engineer. Uh, so, uh, so my talk will, will reflect that. Um, uh, I guess that in the middle is the, is the qubit or something. But, uh, okay, so, um, um, uh, so, so, um, uh, um, you know, I, I uh, work on uh, uh, quantum computing theory uh, most of the time, but actually, you know, when I first heard uh, the idea of quantum computing, I think it was when like, I read a New York Times article about it as a teenager in, you know, 1996 or so, and, you know, my immediate reaction was, this is obvious garbage. Uh, you know, this is, you know, people just keep, you know, uh, uh, coming along with, you know, with ideas about, you know, some miracle computer that could, you know, do everything, right? And there's always some catch. There's always, uh, you know, something, you know, that, that they forgot to model, that some resource that's going to blow up exponentially as you try to scale it up. So, you know, so, so I decided, you know, as a teenager that I was going to read about this and, and just, just, just to figure out what the catch was. Okay, but then I realized that in order to do that, you know, I first had to figure out what the deal was with quantum mechanics itself. Uh, okay, and and then you know if uh, you know you haven't done that, then you know then then you know you're in for a, a, a wild ride, I guess. So uh, uh, okay, so um, um, you know. Um, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, the, uh, the problem is, you know, of course I had, you know, read books about it. Of course I'd heard that light is both a particle and a wave and, you know, cats are both, you know, alive and dead, right? But, you know, it sounds all kind of complicated and confusing, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. And, and, and uh, you know, uh, and, 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 you know, to hear it from the physicist, if you really want to understand this stuff, then, you know, you have to spend, you know, maybe years and years, uh, uh, you know, studying, you know, how to, how to compute, you know, the energy levels of, you know, of various atoms. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and actually that's, that, that's true. You do have to study that stuff if you're interested in, you know, in, in how to sort of explain the, you know, the actual behavior of light and of atoms. And, and molecules. Okay, but uh, the secret, which I'll now let you in on, is that quantum mechanics is actually unbelievably simple uh, once you take the physics out of it. So, uh, so I can just basically show you quantum mechanics in one slide. Okay, the uh, one sentence summary of it is that it is, you know, it is what you'd inevitably get if you tried to invent something which was like probability theory, but which involved complex numbers instead of non-negative real numbers. 
Okay, so uh, just to elaborate a little bit. So what is probability theory, right? It's this uh, um, theory where you encapsulate your knowledge about some system, say that could be in n different states, by uh, assigning it a vector of probabilities. Okay, so you say the probability that this system is in state i is equal to p sub i. Okay, and of course, these probabilities have to be uh, non-negative real numbers. They have to add up to one. Okay, and then uh, there's an evolution rule. So if the system uh, undergoes some change, then you update your description of the system by taking this vector of probabilities and multiplying it by any matrix that has the property that it maps uh, any vector of probabilities to another vector of probabilities. Okay, such a matrix is just called a, a stochastic matrix. Okay, so... Um, now, uh, quantum mechanics is just the same thing, except that you're, you know, now we have to describe our knowledge of a system, at least sort of in the simplest or sort of pure case, by uh, giving it a vector of complex numbers. Okay, so, uh, um, you know, basically, you know, a lot of physics can be summarized by the, the uh, by, by just, you know, the rule that, that sort of uh, in every situation where you would think that the one norm is the only thing that would make sense, uh, God instead chooses the two norm. Okay, so again, another another secret I'm letting you in on. Okay, so uh, so so uh, uh, so it is with quantum mechanics. Uh, so uh, so uh, you know you would think that you know like a, these pro, you know these numbers like you know in a, that would go in a vector here could only be not uh, non-negative reals. Well, no, we're going to let them be complex numbers. Okay, and now the rule is that their two norm has to be conserved. So the meaning the sum of the squares of the absolute values of these numbers has to be one. Okay, and uh, the system, uh, you know, if the system undergoes evolution, that corresponds to just taking this vector of complex numbers and multiplying it by any matrix that maps unit vectors to unit vectors. Okay, and, and uh, such a matrix is called a unitary matrix. All right, so. Uh, uh, so the, sort of the source of all the quantum weirdness or, you know, all of the phenomena that, you know, people uh, uh, talk about of, you know, the uncertainty principle, uh, you know, uh, entanglement, all the things, right? Anytime someone tells you something about, you know, weird behavior of the quantum world that, you know, differs from that of the classical world, you know, either they're wrong or else, you know, they, you know, whatever they're describing can ultimately be understood in terms of this phenomenon of interference. Uh, so, uh, and this is simply the fact that whereas, um, ampli whereas probabilities are always non-negative, amplitudes are complex numbers. And so, you know, if you, you have, you know, and you may have to, you know, to calculate the final amplitude for, for something to happen, you may have to add up a whole bunch of terms, and some of them may be positive, others may be negative, others may be pointing this way and that in the complex plane. And, you know, if they're pointing in all different directions, they could cancel each other out. Okay, and the, if so, the result will be that that, you know, the corresponding event will maybe not happen at all, or will happen with only very small probability. Okay, because uh, the different ways that it could have happened, you know, cancel each other. Okay, and so you can see that in just, you know, the simplest quantum system, which is a single quantum bit or qubit. Okay, so, uh, you know, we can, because, you know, the, the uh, uh, you know, they were, were interested in unit vectors, you know, they, we can, we can write, you know, we can uh, think of the states of one qubit, you know, or at least the, the ones with real amplitudes only as just lying along a circle. Okay, so uh, the zero state is uh, the horizontal. Okay, and by the way, these asymmetric uh, brackets are called the dirac ket notation. You know, you get used to them with time. Okay, they're actually really nice uh, once you, okay. Uh, and, um, you know, and, and the one is uh, um, the orthogonal direction. Okay, so the, so the vertical direction. Okay, and, and these correspond to just two possible outcomes of a measurement on your system, okay, that are perfectly uh, distinguishable. So these could be like, you know, an electron is either in its ground state or its first excited state. Okay, a photon could be either polarized this way or polarized that way. Okay, they're just any, any two states of a system that can be perfectly distinguished by a measurement. Okay, and then what uh, quantum mechanics says is that, you know, if you have that, then the system can also be in any superposition of the states. Okay, which, you know, we would write like um, 
alpha zero plus beta one. Okay, or you know, like you could have this uh, zero plus one over square root of two, for example. You could also have minus zero plus one over square root of two, okay, which is a different superposition. Okay, and now, um, you know, for an example of interference, suppose we apply this unitary transformation, okay, that just takes a vector and rotates it 45 degrees uh, um, counterclockwise uh, in the plane. And you know, if you apply it once, uh, then uh, you know you map the to, uh, uh, zero to the zero plus one over root two. You apply the same operation a second time, then you map that superposition state uh, to the one state. Okay, and for that reason, this operation is uh, uh, known as the square root of naught. Actually, Brian Hayes, who's here, wrote a whole column with uh, uh, about the square root of naught uh, in the you know uh, some twenty years ago, I think. Okay, so. Um, uh, you know, and, and in fact, the, the square root of naught, you know, contains a lot of the, the intuition of, you know, as to what quantum mechanics uh, uh, is about. Because, uh, you know, we can understand what's happening here in terms of interference of amplitudes. Okay, so uh, what's going on is that the first time we apply this operation, uh, zero gets mapped, you know, if you just look at it as, you know, uh, uh, zero, which is the vector one comma zero, right, gets mapped to zero plus one over square root of two. Okay, and then we apply the same operation a second time. Now, quantum mechanics is a linear theory. Okay, so we can think of an operation as acting separately on the zero and the one parts of the superposition. Okay, and so then the zero part will just again get mapped to zero plus one. Okay, but the catch is that the one part, um, because this entry here is, is negative, will get mapped to minus zero plus one. Okay, and now to find the final amplitude for your qubit being in the state zero, you have to add up the amplitudes for all the ways that it could have been zero. So that includes this and this, and as you see, those two amplitudes interfere destructively and cancel each other out. And so that's why you never see zero here. You only ever see one, okay, because the, the, the outcomes leading to one have uh, reinforced each other. All right, so, um, Okay, but now, you know, uh, at some point you have to look at your system, right, and see what it's doing. So uh, the rule for measurement is that if you have, let's say, a qubit and it's in the state, uh, say, alpha zero plus beta one, uh, and let's say you ask the question, you know, you just, you, you ask the system to make up its mind already, right, and just say, are you zero or are you one? Okay, then the rule called the Born rule says it's going to tell you that it's zero with probability absolute value of alpha squared and that it's one with probability absolute value of beta squared. And furthermore, crucially, it sticks with its answer from then on. Okay, so if it tells you one and then you ask it a second time what it is, nothing having changed in the interim, then it will again tell you one. Okay, you don't get independent samples. Okay, uh, so, uh, so famously, measurement in quantum mechanics is a destructive process, right? You have to decide carefully when and how you're going to measure because you may never get another chance, okay, to measure this, you know, this system. Okay, so uh, uh, this is famously illustrated in, you know, the double slit experiment. Okay, so you take a photon. This is, again, my view of what a photon looks like. And you uh, send it uh, you, toward a screen uh, with two slits in it. And then you look, you, you count, you, you see where it ends up on a second screen. Okay, and you keep doing this over and over with lots of photons and you collect the statistics about where it lands on the second screen. And you see this nice wavy interference pattern that there's certain spots where the photon likes to end up and between them, spots where, where, it, like, where it doesn't end up, okay? And uh, this is explained in terms of constructive and destructive interference between the two different paths that the photon could have taken to get to a particular place on the second screen, right? And if, if it arrives here and, you know, arrives here this way and arrives here at the point that way with, you know, two amplitudes that are in phase, then that's a place where the photon's likely to end up. If it arrives the two different ways with amplitudes that are out of phase, then it's not likely to end up there. Okay, however, um, suppose you then look to say, well, you know, which slit is the damn photon going through, right? Uh, then as soon as you look, then the interference pattern disappears and you just see like two Gaussians, right? You just see that, you know, either it goes through this one or that one. Now, I hasten to add that there is nothing important here about it being a conscious observer that's looking, right? It could equally well be a recording device, you know, a computer, which is, you know, or in fact, any physical object whatsoever, you know, including some stray air molecules or radiation or whatever, which is recording the information 
or carrying away the information about which uh, slit the photon went through. Okay, as long as the information leaks out, then the interference will not be observed. Okay, so um, another way to see what's going on is in terms of um, um, entanglement. So if you have, let's say, two qubits and you just put them next to each other, uh, then uh, you know you uh, you form uh, you know the, their joint state using you know what's called the tensor product rule. Okay, it's exactly the same thing as uh, that you would do with classical probability distributions. Okay, you can just sort of expand this out and just multiply these out, so you get alpha gamma zero zero plus alpha delta zero one and so forth. Okay, that's called a, a product state. Okay, but uh, uh, very interestingly, of course, you know, there are some states uh, of two qubits, let's say, that cannot be factored in that way. Okay, uh, um, the most famous of which is this so-called um, EPR, einstein podolsky rosen pair, okay, which is zero, zero, plus one, one over the square root of two. Okay, you can, it's easy to prove that it cannot be factorized like this. Okay, so, uh, so we call it entangled. Um, Okay, so now what's what's called the uh, the deep mystery of quantum mechanics is, uh, you know, who or what decides when the unitary evolution stops and when the measurement part happens, right? So, uh, uh, you know, because if you think about it, right, our measuring devices or you know the atoms in our brains and so forth ought to be governed by exactly the same laws as you know as the as the atoms or the or the qubits that we're measuring, right? And so you know uh, uh, everything you know ought to just be you know, governed by unitary evolution sort of all the time, if you take, you know, if you take this picture seriously. So, so who decides that, okay, at this point, we stop, we halt the unitary evolution, and then we apply this destructive and irreversible measurement process, right? How do the laws of physics know when, you know, when, you know, what counts as a measurement? Okay, so, so as, as it turns out, you know, you can tell a story about what happens during a measurement that only, you know, that just treats it as a special case of ordinary unitary evolution, okay? However, if you want to tell that story, then, you know, you're forced to say the following, okay? That initially you have a qubit, you know, like this, and then, you know, that, that qubit is in a product state with, you know, the whole rest of the, of the universe. Okay, and then as a result of an interaction, for example, shining a laser on the qubit, you know, to find out, you know, what state is it in, uh, the, um, the, the qubit becomes entangled with various information, you know, in the rest of the world. For example, you know, the, uh, the, what's written in the computer memory or, you know, the position of a dial on the recording device or the atoms in your brain that are, you know, recording, you know, having, having seen the answer or, you know, or whatever stray, you know, radiation, uh, 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 you know, is, is then, you know, is, is, is produced by all of that. Okay, so then you get an entangled state like this and so, so the picture is that, that actually this collapse never really happens. Uh, you know, the, um, the qubit just sort of collapses to zero or to one sort of relative to you, right? Um, but really, you know, if you wrote the full state, then it would look like this. Okay, and so people have argued about this for a long time, uh, you know, and the debate could be summed up as many worlds are many words, I guess. So, you know, so to some people, you know, this is, the formalism is clearly telling you that, you know, the universe splits into two parallel copies, and in one of them, you see the outcome zero, and in the other one, you know, you have a doppelganger who sees the outcome one, okay? And, you know, you can keep going on and, you know, maybe, you know, one of you, you know, becomes a, a bricklayer and the other one becomes a, you know, a theoretical physicist or whatever, right? So, uh, okay, so, you know, you have all these different life histories. Okay, other people say, well, that's just, you know, empirically meaningless uh, because, you know, you never see the other one anyway. So, you know, we might, you know, if we're going to be hard-headed scientists, we should just ignore it and say it doesn't figure into our explanation. Okay. Um, personally, you know, I, I tend to agree with every interpretation of quantum <laughs> mechanics uh, to the extent that it criticizes the other interpretations. So, okay. So, uh, all right. So, so now let me let me tell you about uh, uh, quantum computing. Uh, uh, so, uh, so this was, um, you know, so people sort of debated these sort of philosophical issues for you know almost a century. But you know, in, in the 1980s, sort of people asked, you know, a very, a new kind of question that, you know, I think gave, you know, an amazing new perspective on these, on these very old uh, uh, issues. Uh, and uh, so what people started noticing, uh, like Richard Feynman and like David Deutsch, is that, uh, 
if you, um, you know, have a general entangled state, not just of two qubits, but of, let's say, n, then to fully describe it, you need a vector of uh, two to the n amplitudes. Okay, one for every possible configuration of all n of the bits. That's an enormous amount of information for nature to be keeping track of, right? Just saying, you know, for like a thousand particles that, well, you know, what, off to the side somewhere, it needs like more scrap paper than would fit in the whole observable universe. Okay, so, uh, um, you know, this presents an obvious practical problem uh, if you're trying to use a conventional computer to simulate quantum mechanics. Okay, and Chemists and, and physicists had known that for a long time, right? I mean, uh, uh, apparently about 10% of the supercomputing cycles that, you know, are used by the, the Department of Energy are just for, you know, trying to simulate quantum mechanics, right? Solve the, you know, the Schrodinger equation, basically, that governs the unitary evolution. Okay, so, uh, uh, but then um, 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 Feynman, you know, uh, uh, asked, you know, in 1981, well, you know, if, if, if this is so, if, you know, we have to go to all, to all this work to simulate quantum mechanics, well, then why not turn things around, right? Why not build a computer that itself, you know, exploits uh, the same, you know, principles of uh, superposition and interference that we're having such a hard time simulating? Okay, so what would such a computer be good for if we built it? Uh, well, you know, what's clear, it would be good for at least one thing, namely simulating quantum physics, okay? So uh, what, 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 what wasn't clear, what remained unclear for a long time, you know, for a decade afterward was uh, uh, whether such a computer would also be good for anything else, okay? Uh, so that's why it was a great uh, um, breakthrough in 1994 when Peter Shore showed that actually, you know, such a computer could, uh, be used uh, to factor integers in, in polynomial time. Okay, and you know, number theorists may uh, care about that a lot, you know, and there's other people who also care about that. Okay, so, um, all right, so where are we in terms of actually building quantum computers? Well, I'm very proud to report that after, you know, uh, what, like almost 20 years and, you know, more than a billion dollars invested in this field, by some estimates, uh, quantum computer has recently been used uh, successfully to factor 21 into three times seven uh, with high probability. Uh, this, was, uh, this was using uh, optics, this was using like this a technique called qubit recycling. You know, this was for, for a long time, it was, the, you know, it was only 15, uh, now, now it's 21. Okay, so, you know, what, what is so, you know, this doesn't sound very impressive, what, what, what's, what's the difficulty here, right? Well, uh, the, uh, the huge problem in trying to scale this up to a reasonable size, as you may have heard, is uh, something called decoherence, okay? And it just directly relates to the fact that I said earlier that, uh, um, that, that any leakage of, you know, quantum information into the external world is going to just look like measurement. Okay, so uh, uh, if any sort of stray particle comes through, you know, your computer while it's computing and carries away some, you know, uh, information about what state the computer was in, then it will be as if someone has gone in and prematurely measured your computer, okay, and prematurely uh, collapsed its state. Okay, so this reason, you know, quantum computation has been compared to baking a souffle. I wouldn't know. I've never baked a souffle, but uh, you know, that apparently, you know, if you if you you know open the oven in the middle to look at how it's doing, then the thing collapses, and then you have to start over. Okay, so uh, um, you know, so so you have to keep the thing, you know, uh, uh, incredibly well isolated from the external environment, and for this reason, quantum computing experiments often involve cooling to very close to absolute zero. Okay, uh, but then at the same time, you need to be able to go in and move the qubits around in order to do the, op the operations that you want. Okay, and it's those twin requirements that, that make things uh, uh, extremely hard. Uh, now, uh, you know, there, there, there are s such uh, demanding requirements that, you know, some people, many physicists thought in the 90s that it could never work. Uh, what uh, uh, changed many, many people's minds was uh, a huge discovery called uh, the fault tolerance theorem, which was, uh, I guess combined work of many people, uh, you know, in the, in the mid 1990s, and uh, uh, what this says is that um, uh, you know if if you just get the level of decoherence down to some finite level, not to zero, okay, but let's say to you know uh, um, like a one percent chance of an error per qubit. 
per gate operation time. Right? Originally, it was like a 10 to the minus 6 chance, okay? But, you know, and since then, under depending what assumptions you're willing to make, people have, you know, uh, developed codes that can handle larger and larger amounts of error, right? And now, under some, you know, aggressive assumptions, it's maybe even 1% or so, okay? But, uh, you know, if you, uh, ha you know, if as long as your error is sort of below some, some critical value, uh, you can, um, actually, uh, um, um, you know, use very clever error correcting codes to, um, um, to, to correct the errors, you know, sort of as they're happening. You can do it faster than you're introducing new errors. Okay, so that's why, you know, there's some threshold, right? This is like the break even point where you're, you know, correcting errors faster than you're creating new ones. Okay, and furthermore, you can correct these errors without measuring the information that, you know, that would destroy your quantum computation. You only measure in a way that tells you whether an error has occurred or not, and if so, how to fix it. Okay, so, uh, you know, it violated many people's intuitions about, you know, about quantum mechanics, but, uh, you know, uh, it, it was, you know, a theorem. Okay, so, uh, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, you could then, you know, do an, like an arbitrarily long quantum computation. Okay, so I've, I've compared this threshold to like the, uh, the uh, critical mass for a nuclear weapon, right? I mean, before you're there, it just, you know, looks like a pile that's sitting there. It's doing nothing impressive, right? So, you know, people say, oh, you know, you've only factored 21, right? How about 35 or something, right? Uh, but, you know, that's sort of the wrong metric, right? You know, once you get uh, past the threshold, then you ought to be able, you know, at least, you know, if the theory is correct, to scale things up, you know, arbitrarily, okay, to as many qubits as you want. How many yeah. extra qubits do I need for the coding? Yeah, so that's that's a big question. So uh, it actually uh, there's a trade-off between this uh, threshold and the number of extra qubits you need. So people have shown that you know you may be able to handle at least in numerical simulations even like three percent error, but that's maybe like with a, a million physical qubits per logical qubit, right? And with you know a, a small you know there, with, with like a reasonable size blow up in the number of qubits, like you know maybe you know seven or ten or something, right, then, you know, then the, the amount of error you can deal with is currently much smaller, right? Just, yeah. Even, I mean, from physical constraints, yeah. as the system becomes bigger, yep. is it harder to do, uh, you know, keep the decoy parents at that same level? Uh, so, so that, yeah, so, 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 so that is an issue, right? You can have, you can have, what you can have crosstalk. So as you add more qubits, right, they have, you know, you mostly want to use their short range interactions, right? But they also have longer range interactions. And so with each, yeah, with each qubit you add, then, you know, there can be more and more crosstalk, you know? So, so if you look at some of the, the uh, you know, the designs that have been put forward for quantum computing architectures, the qubits would be like in different cubby holes and they'd be taken out and moved around, you know, using, using lasers to, you know, to just so that you know, when two qubits are supposed to interact, then you bring those two together, right? And otherwise they're not close to each other. Okay, and actually, you know, some of you may know that just this past year, David Wineland won the Nobel Prize in physics, you know, largely for, 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 ex for experimentally demonstrating at least, you know, a lot of these building blocks that you can actually do this stuff with ions, that you can, you know, move them around in a trap, you know, move two of them close to each other, move one of them away, you know, have it talk to another one and so forth, you know, at least with three or four qubits. Okay, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's do, do their right. whole design error corrected, and then maybe there would be less overhead. Or yeah, it, it, it's entirely possible. I mean, I mean, first of all, you know, the fault tolerance theorem, because you know they had to prove it as a theorem, they had to make like the most pessimistic assumptions about the error, right? And it's entirely plausible that you can be, you know, much more aggressive with you know, in terms of, you know, what kind of error you allow and that, you know, the code will still work, yeah, right? But, yeah. For a specific yeah. computation, you might yeah. uh, actually say that you don't need to decode uh, at every, at every yeah. gate. Yeah, that's right. That's right, that's right. Yeah, so it's, it's entirely possible that they won't, you know, use it as a black box, but will, you know, open up the box and take out the pieces that they, that, that, that they need to, you know, I mean, for them, the ultimate 
question is just, you know, does it work, right? <laughs> so, okay, um, yeah. So, okay, so, so in fact, you know, if you read, you know, many uh, discussions about, you know, the feasibility of quantum computation, uh, they tend, you know, they focus almost entirely on this fault tolerance theorem and, you know, and the hypotheses behind it. You know, are they reasonable, are they not? Okay, you know, and, and, and it's understandable, you know, I guess why they do that. But um, personally, I take a different approach, okay? Um, you know, my focus is different. The reason I, I take it as obvious that if quantum computing were impossible for some fundamental reason, then there would have to be a deeper explanation for its impossibility than just, you know, such and such error correction schemes may not work against every conceivable kind of noise that people can think of, okay? Because if that were the case, I would want to push further and ask, well, well, why is that so? You know, um, why is there noise that's always going to kill you no matter what you do? Okay, so for example, um, uh, many quantum computing skeptics have pointed out that, okay, you know, these theorems, at least initially, you know, required the assumption that the noise uh, from one qubit to another was uncorrelated. Okay, that you had independent noise on each qubit. Okay, now that's obviously not a perfectly valid assumption. You, you know, you will have correlations in noise. And today there are fault tolerance theorems that handle, you know, some amount of correlation in, in the noise. Okay, but, you know, but, but maybe uh, the, the noise will be correlated in a way that violates the assumptions of the theorems. Okay, and, um, you know, and, and in fact I talked to some, um, so like uh, quantum computing skeptics like, like Gil Kalai, right, and they view their, you know, they, what they think of it in terms of, you know, nature is like a cryptographic adversary, right? And if there's any way that nature could design the noise in order to kill the quantum computation, then that's what we should assume that nature does, right? So, um, um, you know, yeah, exactly, exactly, as if, right, right, so, right, right, so, so, right, so, so it's like a, it's like a worldview where the universe would have been specially rigged to kill quantum computation, right? And, uh, yeah, right, that's right, that's right, that's right, yeah. So, uh, you know, but I, I would want to push back further and say, well, you know, then, you know, there must be some deeper explanation, right? There must be some way, just, you know, in terms of, you know, like, you know, the, uh, the laws of physics, right, in terms of uniformly acting laws of physics, why I can understand how no matter what error correcting code I make up, the noise, you know, that there, there will be noise that kills me, right? It's, to me, it is not a satisfying explanation if you have to, you know, uh, say, well, well, you make up an error correcting code and then I'll make up a noise model that kills it. Okay, so, uh, so okay, so, you know, as I've alluded to, there are, you know, uh, phys some physicists and computer scientists who remain, you know, vocally convinced that scalable quantum computing is completely impossible. So here are some of them, you know, Gerard Hoof, famous physicist, Gil Kalai, I just mentioned, um, Oded Goldreich, Stephen Wolfram, uh, Robert Alicki, uh, and uh, Diakonov, these are two, also two physicists, uh, Leonid Levin, who some of us know. Uh, so, um, Okay, and perhaps a much larger number who are sort of silently skeptical or, you know, are on, on the sidelines or something. Okay, so, you know, uh, one historical analogy that I really like here is, uh, you know, to um, um, Charles Babbage, right, who had this idea of building an analytical engine, you know, in the 1820s. And, uh, you know, and, and it was, you know, very natural at the time for people to think, okay, it's a very cute idea. But, you know, it, it's, you know, I don't know if they would have put it exactly this way, but, you know, it's not going to scale in practice, okay? Because, you know, there's always going to be, you know, you know, you've got all these gears, these me mechanical things, right? There's, you know, there's always going to be little imperfections that will, you know, prevent you from, you know, making, ever making this sort of more than a, a cute little toy. Okay, and the interesting thing is those people were right for 130 years. <laughs> Okay, that's, you know, think about that, right? There is more than a century in which those people could just continue crowing, you know, that no one had managed to do it and could just continue to be right. Okay, you know, <laughs> eventually the technology caught up with the theory, okay? It required, you know, the invention, I guess, first of the vacuum tube and then of the transistor, which are things that Babbage could, could, could not have even foreseen, okay? But, um, yeah, okay, uh, so, yeah. I mean, they didn't have a theory of error correction in those days. Right? Yeah, that, that, that's true. So actually, von Neumann supplied the theory of classical fault tolerance in the 1950s. And that was partly in response to people who said that, you know, you know, you know even then that classical computing wouldn't scale because, you know, you're always going to have some 
bugs in your vacuum tubes, maybe literally bugs, you know, insects <laughs> nesting in them, right? And, you know, and you put piece together enough vacuum tubes, it's never going to work, right? So, you know, he proved this theorem saying, you know, you can actually build a reliable classical computer out of unreliable components, you know, provided that the error rate is small enough. And the quantum fault tolerance theorem is really just the quantum analog of, of von Neumann's theorem. Okay, so... Um, and his original design does work. Yeah. Yep, that's true. That's also true. So, uh, yeah, so, um, you know, it's, um, you know, I, I think that there's like a whole, I just learned that there's like a whole genre of science fiction that sort of takes, you know, uh, like, uh, is, is about like, like, what if, you know, like, like Victorian technology, like, became the future, and so you had, like, you know, computers based on, you know, Babbage-style mechanical devices, and, you know, maybe that's an alternate history. Okay, in, in our history, it seemed that to really make it practical seemed to require electronics, but, okay, so... <laughs> Yeah. Um, all right. So let me, you know, outline sort of three possible sort of skeptical positions and my responses to them. Uh, so, um, you know, this is like the slide, you know, I guess after this slide you can doze off if you want. But uh, uh, so, all right, the first skeptical position is the one that says, uh, look, the difficulties in building a scalable quantum computer are immense. Okay, so this might not be practical for a very long time, and sometimes people will add, and even if it finally succeeds, quantum computing will have only limited applications. Okay, uh, simulating quantum physics, you know, breaking cryptography, you know, speeding up combinatorial, you know, the solutions to optimization problems somewhat, you know, we're not exactly sure by how much. Okay, maybe a few other things, right? Um, Okay, so my response to this position is agreement. <laughs> this is all true. Okay. Uh, so, uh, all right. The second skeptical position, you know, is, uh, you know, is the one that, 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 that interests me more. Okay, this is, uh, you know, people who, who go further uh, than that, and they say, um, no, uh, quantum computing has to fail, you know, even in principle, even a thousand or a million years from now. Okay, because, you know, sometimes they say it is, you know, either it is likely that or it is obvious that quantum mechanics itself is wrong. Okay, and, to, you know, to me the reaction to that is kind of obvious, you know, awesome, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, that sounds like a revolution in physics, you know, a hundred times more exciting even than building a quantum computer. So, you know, count me in, right? If building a quantum computer, you know, and having, it, you know, understanding why it fails leads to the discovery of, you know, a revision in quantum mechanics, right, then, you know, we couldn't be happier. Okay, so, uh, all right, uh, so now, you know, but then there's a third position, right? And so many, many of the skeptics will push back and they'll say, no, 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 no. We don't think anything is wrong with quantum mechanics. You know, uh, quantum mechanics is fine. It's only quantum computing that we object to, okay? They say quantum, you know, you know, quantum mechanics is true, but on top of quantum mechanics, there has to be some kind of principle of unavoidable noise or unavoidable decoherence or something uh, that will prevent, you know, scalable quantum computing from ever working. Okay, and so my response to this third objection is, you know, that, that's also, you know, really interesting and wonderful. And so what I want to know is, you know, can you explain your principle of unavoidable noise, right? How does it work? Uh, you know, how can you derive it from, you know, sort of underlying, law, you know, physical laws? Um, and furthermore, you know, can you show that it really does kill quantum computing? Okay, so, um, so, so to come back to Gil Kalai, right, he's, you know, very much advocates this path number three, you know, and he believes that there's a principle of unavoidable noise. You know, right now there's just two gaps in his argument. He can't explain why the principle is true, and if it is true, he can't explain why it would make quantum computing impossible. But he sort of. Can you explain what the principle is? Yeah. Mm, that's if that's if also iffy. <laughs> but you know, but he's certain that you know, you know. So, um, um, okay. So, but the the thing that that I most want to know uh, here is, um, okay, if you have such a principle, then can we turn things on their head? Um, you know, if it's really totally impossible to use any uh, quantum system to solve a computational problem, you know, say asymptotically fa or exponentially faster than a classical computer would solve it, then does that then suggest that there should be a, uh, an efficient classical simulation for any realistic quantum system, you know, for any of the quantum systems occurring in nature? Okay, and if so, what is that classical simulation? How does it work? What does it look like? 
right? And this is, you know, something that sort of none of the skeptics sort of even, you know, have be, be, begun to answer, right? They're sort of always sort of, you know, just focused on killing quantum computing, but then I want to turn that around and make lemons out of that lemonade and say, well, then we should be able to use our existing computers to simulate, you know, all the possible quantum systems. And yeah, yeah. Isn't something in the middle also possible? So for instance, mm -hmm. uh, there are some uh, inherent problems that would not allow you to, for instance, uh, apply Schwarz algorithm. Mm -hmm. ah. You could do some other things that you mm -hmm. couldn't simulate with a classical. Yes, computer. thank you. That's absolutely possible. That I'm going to count as a victory for quantum computing, <laughs> okay? If you can't do Shor's algorithm, but you can do something else, which is still hard to simulate with a classical computer, okay, then, you know, the, the sort of border, you know, the, that's enough to say that the borders of the efficiently computable are not what, you know, classical computer science thought that they were. Okay, and so actually I'm going to come back to that at the very end of my talk when I will talk about, you know, exactly such a, you know, a weak model of quantum computing. It doesn't let you do Shor's algorithm, we don't think, but does let you do something that, that we think is classically hard. Okay, that, but, but yeah, that, uh, that is a possibility. Yep. Okay. We don't really know that the Shor's algorithm is doing something that can't be That's done. also true. And in fact, thank you, Brian, that leads to my my fourth skeptical position, the one that I won't address in this talk, which is which is the position that says that you know um, quantum computing, yeah, maybe it can work, but 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 who cares? Because everything that a quantum computer can do can be efficiently simulated by a classical computer, and thus there is an efficient classical algorithm for factoring integers, for example. Okay, and for you know simulating quantum physics and doing all these other things. Okay, and uh, uh, the reason I'm not going to address this is. You know, come on, really? Uh, uh, no, uh, you know, I think, you know, really that this, this, this would be a different talk. This is an orthogonal issue. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Your, your third point there. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, are you implying that there, there could be some statistical mechanics kind of thing, like, uh, at a smaller scale? So, so what do you mean? Well, well, so, 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 so it's hard for me to be very precise because the people who argue this are not very precise, you know, or, or I don't, I don't fully understand what, what they're saying, right? But the idea would be, okay, so here, 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 here's an example. Suppose that there were some fundamental decoherence mechanism in nature, right, that was always just sort of, de you know, measuring every cube, you know, God was measuring every qubit, you know, at every instant with some probability, okay? And suppose that the rate at which that happened was above the fault tolerance threshold. Okay, then that would be, a, you know, that would be an understandable reason why we couldn't build a, a scalable quantum computer. Then you don't right. have to do global quantum simulation. You have to do basically a classical simulation with some local or... I don't understand what you're talking about. So what is the red about? thing? So where does this red thing come oh, from? Oh, so, okay, so, so, so the point is, you know, it, like there seems to be like a wall of the excluded middle, right? Either quantum systems can do something that cannot be efficiently simulated by classical computers, or else they cannot, right? <laughs> so, you know, if they can, then, you know, you have some kind of quantum computer, right? If they can't, then, you know, then this sort of suggests that there ought to be an efficient classical simulator for these systems. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so let me try to dig down and identify what, what seem like to me like the common reasons for quantum computing skepticism. Uh, so I think many people, you know, just think, you know, it just sounds too good to be true, or it sounds like science fiction. Uh, I actually, I have a, 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 a response to that that I like, which is that uh, I don't think any science fiction writer would ever have made up a type of computer that can do factoring and discrete logarithm, but that can't do NP-complete problems. Okay. I think that that's beyond the imagination of a science fiction writer. <laughs> so this, you know, this, this sort of weird pattern of, you know, of what you can and can't do is, you know, okay, uh, fine. Okay, so, you know, a second uh, uh, reason I think is, you know, annoyance at the, you know, sort of hype and misrepresentations in the popular press that, you know, that it is this, this you know, super duper computer that's going to be on store shelves in five years and it will do absolutely everything. And it will do it by trying all the possibilities in parallel and instantly finding the best one. Okay, uh, my response to this is tell me about it. Uh, I've been trying to fight this for 10 years. Uh, but, you know, uh, you know, I try, you know, my goal is not to sort of overcorrect in the opposite direction. I, you know, I want to get it right. Okay, so, um, 
Um, okay, uh, the third uh, uh, reason is, you know, a belief in uh, what computer scientists know is the extended church Turing thesis. Okay, and this is the idea that, you know, any reasonable, uh, uh, you know, uh, a comp computation ought to be simulable uh, uh, with only polynomial uh, blow up in resources by a deterministic Turing machine. Okay, and of course, if quantum computers, you know, uh, could indeed be built and if factoring was hard, you know, the, assuming factoring is hard, then this would violate the extended charge Turing thesis. Okay, and so you may say, then, you know, if ECT is my axiom, then quantum computing is, is ruled out. Okay, well, so the response to this, of course, is, well, the, the extended church turing thesis was never anything but an encroachment of computer science onto the turf of physics. So, you know, we don't get to cry foul if, if physics then sort of counter-encroaches us, right? So, uh, you know, by the way, I'd say the original church turing thesis about computability was, was also an encroachment of computer science onto physics's turf, except that in that case, you know, we seem to have won. Okay. <laughs> so, um, okay. And then there's sort of some maybe m more interesting, you know, reasons. So, so there's sort of some some intuition, you know, uh, many people have that says that, uh, look, you know, it's just not plausible that a system of n particles would be able to encode two to the n bits of information. You know, a any theory which is telling us that has to be extravagant in some way and is probably has you know too many too much redundant information in it and should be replaced by a better theory where this is not true okay uh, you know and then of course there there's you know I think often you'll just find you know an underlying skepticism of quantum mechanics itself maybe even of modern physics in general right because I think you know it's very easy for people to you know hear about you know black holes and quarks and you know all kinds of you know, thing, you know, and just sort of treat it as, you know, okay, these are these are like fun things to, you know, for someone to to, you know, think about or, you know, or, or, or write science fiction about or something, right? But then, you know, if it's actually if if this stuff is actually changing what can be computed in polynomial time, then it's like, oh, you know, well, well it's just gotten real. Okay, now we actually have to worry about this. And so it sort of puts people face to face with some, you know, with sort of aspects of physics that maybe, you know, they wanted to sort of, you know, they always wanted to sort of not, not take seriously, but, yeah, you know, like no. Weapons, yeah, that's right. That's another example. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, so, so let me actually talk some more about these, these last two. Uh, so, so first of all, what can we say about the argument that, you know, like, like, it's it just extravagant to be able to store an exponential amount of information in, you know, the state of a, of a mere n particles. Uh, so, you know, so, so you may say the following, okay, shouldn't we search for a more reasonable theory? You know, so a theory that would agree with quantum mechanics on all the existing experiments, but, you know, it should have, you know, m nicer properties. For example, you know, using like polynomial resources, we should only be able to prepare a singly exponential number of sort of really different states, not a doubly exponential number. Right. Uh, furthermore, in a volume of size n, you know, we should only be able to reliably store and retrieve a polynomial number of classical bits, not an exponential number. Okay. And then, you know, you may even say some more, some fancier things. Like, you should be able to take an exponential number of possible different measurements on your state of n particles, and you should be able to summarize the results of all of those measurements using a string of only a polynomial number of classical bits. Okay, and maybe even more ambitiously, you would like, you know, the states of n particles to be pack learnable, so to be learnable in the, you know, in the in, in valiant sense. Okay, with, um, you know, using a number, an amount of sample data that scales only polynomially with the number of particles and not exponentially. All right, well, so here is my uh, my newsflash. Uh, such a theory um, actually exists. It's called quantum mechanics. <laughs> Okay, so, you know, I think many people, you know, like, you know, if, if you have this sort of, uh, uh, you know, simplistic view of a, of a, you know, n qubits as just being this exponentially long vector, then, you know, you, you know, you can, you can be easily led to think that this is just too extravagant to be right. But then, you know, if you, once you remember that you're incredibly limited in how you can actually act, you know, extract information from a quantum system, Right, and you start formulating, you know, operationally, what do you mean by the amount of information in the system, right? And you say, look, I'm only going to count the information as being there if I can reliably retrieve it, okay? And you start, you know, imposing criteria like that. Then you actually find that that 
in, in some sense, quantum mechanics is much, much more, more reasonable. Yeah. Do one slide. <laughs> uh, and so they, they require they require proof. Uh, so this one this this one no this this one is trivial. Yeah 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 no the, okay so this is yeah yes they all do follow. This one this one this right that's right that's that's right no further axioms involved. You know uh, 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 you know this one is actually kind of trivial. Just, I'm just saying that you know although there's a doubly exponential number of states there's only a singly exponential number that you can prepare by a polynomial size circuit. Okay, uh, you know, this one is um, basically Halevo's theorem, right, that bounds the amount of quantum information and, you know, or bound, you know, bounds the amount of classical information that you can encode into a quantum state in such a way that you can reliably retrieve it. Okay, and these two are results of mine uh, from, you know, 2004. This was my quantum post-selection theorem, and this was my quantum pack learning theorem. Okay. Good. Okay, good. So, all right, so, so now, you know, suppose that, Scalable quantum computing is impossible. Okay, well then an obvious question is, what is the criterion that tells us which quantum mechanical experiments can be done and which ones can't? Uh, so, all right, so let me go through a few possibilities. Uh, so first one would be, maybe the issue is the, the amount of precision in the amplitudes themselves. Okay, and this is, you know, Leonid Levin's view. If you go to his webpage, right, he has, uh, this, this essay where he says the major problem with quantum computing is the requirement that basic quantum equations hold to multi-hundredth, if not millionth decimal positions where the significant digits of the relevant amplitudes reside. We have never seen a physical law valid to over a dozen decimals. Are quantum amplitudes still complex numbers to such accuracies? Or do they become quaternions, colored graphs, or sick-humored gremlins? Okay, so, you know, well, I, I, uh, I, 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 I uh, appreciate the, uh, the, the, the writing. There's sort of an obvious response to this, which is uh, take a million photons, let's say, and put them all through a 45-degree polarizing filter, right? And then, you know, uh, by the tensor product rule from my previous slide in order to describe, you know, that's an absolutely trivial experiment to do, right? And yet to describe the state produced as, as outcome, right, you're going to have, you know, amplitudes that are like one over two to the 500,000, okay? So, you know, it, so it seems obvious that, you know, we can have some systems in nature that involve incredibly small amplitudes. Now that shouldn't, that shouldn't shock us, right? If you took a classical coin and flipped it, you know, a million times, then, you know, the probability of getting the particular sequence of outcomes that you saw is going to be like two to the minus a million. Now does that mean that the laws of probability will start breaking down because the numbers are too small? Right? Yeah. Something, I mean, you, you, like you mentioned before, yeah. it's actually very hard to make a product state and keep it a product state. Uh, what? Uh, did, so, sorry, no, I didn't say that. I mean, this is, this, this is actually, uh, this is fine. I mean, as long as you don't have to keep the photons confined, if you can just send them all out into space, then they could stay coherent for billions of years. Yeah. This way, you point them that yeah, way. exactly. You can even take the same electrons and just, you know, look at them, look at them sideways, <laughs> change the angle at which you look at them, exactly. and yeah, and yeah. They they're not talking to each other. So yeah, <laughs> right. Just and just that. the fact that you decided to include another collection of photons in the next room in your calculations yeah. will make these numbers go down. Uh, uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's also true. Yeah. So yeah. So if I'm trying to understand this argument, this yeah. sounds to me like someone. You know, someone trying to plan some uh, interstellar stellar travel system yeah. based on Newtonian physics and yeah. someone else telling them, well, you don't even know that Newtonian physics works mm -hmm. with such large masses and such large velocities. And mm -hmm. that's sort of what the way I understand this argument. Mm -hmm. Is that maybe yeah, but... but of that, no, no, that, of course, yes, yeah, that's right. That's exactly what he's saying, and now I'm responding to that, right? I'm saying that, you know, y it, yes, it is true that quantum mechanics might break down at some, you know, at some level or at some scale, but, but now we can try to ask the further question, what could that level or scale be, okay? And now I'm saying that it can't be quite the thing that, that uh, Leonid is suggesting here. Okay, because you know to produce tiny amplitudes, you know, at least by itself, is is a trivial thing to accomplish, right? So we can you know do it routinely. Okay, so uh, by the way, is, uh, yeah. you are actually going to get exactly the, s the state zero plus one over square two. Oh well, you know, with with some little errors here, but but that won't change the smallness of the amplitudes I mean, or the fact that the smaller. state will be approximately this one. Yeah, the, the amplitude will be small, yeah. but uh, and I guess you will still know them to some pretty small yeah. accuracy. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's true. You'll know them like the m multiplicatively at a very high accuracy. That's right. Okay, so all right, so now we can push back and say, okay, look, we didn't really mean to say, you know, the amp, you know, it's the smallness of the amplitudes that's the issue, right? Of course, you can have product states of lots of qubits, okay, but you know, entanglement, you know, between you know multiple qubits that we think is an illusion. All right, well, there's an obvious response to that, which is this famous Bell inequality that sort of demonstrated the, you know. Uh, you know, at least to, to most people, the, the reality of entanglement, uh, uh, you know, and, you know, which has been violated in ex experiments since, since the 1980s. Okay, uh, my favorite way to explain the Bell inequality is in terms of a game involving, you know, two of the most, you know, I guess familiar characters of computer science, uh, Jennifer and Christian. So, uh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, that's right. The violation, the violation is the good part for quantum mechanics. That's right. Thank you, Eddie. This is the violation. So, so the inequality is that the certain game where they receive these two inputs, they have to produce these outputs that satisfy this condition. And in a classical world where the where they did not share entangled particles, but only you know classical correlation, one can prove that they could only ever win this game three quarters of the time and not more. However, if they share entangled particles, then there's a, a, a strategy by which they can win at 85% of the time. Okay, so that's the Bell inequality, the fact that 0.85 is more than 0.75. Okay. What? Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what? In our world, they always win it. <laughs> oh, okay, yes, thank you. So they have what's called a non-local box. Okay, all right. So, yeah. Um, all right, so, so then, you know, the next thing that people say is, well, okay, fine, you know, two or three particles might be entangled, but, you know, a thousand particles could never be entangled, right? So the issue was just, you know, when you try to entangle too many particles, then this is where quantum mechanics is going to break down. And this is actually a very common position, right? I just, I, he I hear it constantly, like from, uh, um, uh, Okay, but it, I, I don't think it works either because we have, you know, uh, many, many experiments today that, you know, uh, involve, you know, in, entanglement among, you know, hundreds or thousands of particles and that, you know, g g give precisely the predictions of, of quantum mechanics, okay? So for example, the double slit experiment that I mentioned before has now been done not only with photons but with buckyballs, with carbon-60 molecules, and now with actually much larger molecules even than that, like, floppy, you know, biomolecules, right, with, you know, hundreds of, of particles in them, okay? And this whole thing is in a superposition of, you know, of two different places, okay? So, um, yeah. Like two such balls and they're yeah. entangled with each other? They're, well, well, they're in a superposition of going through one path and going through the other. So you can interpret that as, you know, as an entangled state, right? Yeah, you see the interference pattern, yeah. Yeah, this is a, the Zeilinger group in, in Vienna has been, has been doing this. Yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, so high temperature superconductors, like, you know, like this guy here, okay? Uh, you know, so, um, you know, they, they definitely involve, you know, sort of coherent quantum effects, you know, among, you know, any millions or billions of particles, right? Now, it's, it's true that sort of these are not yet, you know, you know, maybe fair to call quantum computers, right? Because we can't control the entanglement, you know, to make it do the specific computations that we want. Okay, but what this, is, what, what this argument shows is that the criterion, the thing that makes quantum computing impossible, cannot be that just that sort of entanglement of, you know, among thousands of particles is impossible. Okay, it, can, it can't be that. It has to be something else. Uh, so what's needed, you know, is what I described in 2004 as a sure, sure separator. Okay, so we need some principal dividing line between the things that we are sure that we can do and the things that suffice for Shor's algorithm. Okay, so the question is what can the separator be, right? And this is always my question for the skeptics. Okay, so, you know, I, in the same paper, I, I tried to do the skeptics' work for them and propose a candidate which I called a uh, tree size. And so I said, look, you know, yeah, maybe, you know, you can have entanglement of thousands of particles, but, you know, let's say we, we, we ask for, like, what is the, the smallest formula by which you could express your quantum state by using, you know, where the, the, the nodes would be uh, 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 sums and tensor products, right? So you can take, like, a tensor product of two states or, you know, uh, on disjoint sets of qubits, or you can take a linear combination of two states on the same set of qubits, okay? And you have to represent your state in this way. And then let's say, you know, that, that, that the only states that are physically reasonable are those states of n qubits that can be represented by a tree of this form that has only polynomial size. 
Okay, let's say that if the tree has to be exponentially large, then we're going to say that that state is physically unreasonable. Right? That would be, you know, that, that seemed to me, you know, at least a lot of the states people talk about, even highly entangled ones like Schrodinger cats, you know, actually have quite small trees. Right? So this, this might seem like a, a reasonable criterion. Okay, but it turns out that this one doesn't work either. Okay, so if you just look at states of like n identical fermions or bosons, you can actually use a very beautiful result of Ron Ross from 2004 which lower bounded uh, what's called the multilinear formula size of the permanent and the determinant and show that you need at least n to the log n uh, gates in a multilinear formula for these things, okay? In order to show that any tree representing a state of just identical non-interacting fermions or bosons would need to have size, well, which is at least somewhat super polynomial in, in the number of qubits, right, n to the log n. Okay, and this probably can also be proved, you know, though I haven't done it, for two and three-dimensional spin lattices. There's just, you know, like a, a lattice of qubits with like a pair, pairwise nearest neighbor interactions, right? That probably also, you know, already has a, a super polynomial tree size. And that's something that's, you know, very sort of well studied in condensed matter physics and, uh, you know, seems to, you know, obey quantum mechanics, right? So, uh, yeah, and in fact, in all of these cases, the true tree size is probably exponential in n, but this is an open problem. We don't yet have the tools to, to prove that kind of thing. Okay, uh, so I was going to discuss something called epistemic hidden variable theories, which are another way to try to, you know, escape quantum mechanics, and I have, you know, and some recent results with, uh, that uh, my students and I had about ruling out different epistemic theories. However, since I'm running out of time, I think I'm going to skip this part, and I can come back to it later if people want. This was the, you know, <laughs> technical part of the talk. Okay, so uh, you can see, yes, technical stuff. Okay, it's you can feel satisfied that it's there. Okay, and if you know, if you want, I'll come back to it later. Okay, um, all right. So let me just, you know, come briefly to, to my last thing. Okay, which is that, uh, you know, if you may wonder now if scalable quantum computing is indeed possible, um, are there any experiments that could help demonstrate that short of actually building a completely general purpose quantum computer, right? Could we just have a special purpose quantum computer that just, you know, that just sort of proves the point, okay? So, uh, uh, you know, there's a, f or, you know or, or there's a few possibilities for what kind of experiments we could do. We could try to just keep one, a single qubit coherent for an extremely long time. Right now, the world record for doing that is about 15 minutes, okay, in ion traps, right? They can keep a qubit coherent, okay? Uh, so, you know, you can, you know, to really keep a qubit coherent, just one qubit coherent for days or for weeks, you might already need quantum error correction, okay? You know, if, I mean, if you want to keep the qubit sort of localized in your lab rather than traveling through interstellar space, okay, then it can stay coherent for billions of years, okay? So, um, um, you know, you can also try to build a quantum computer which is specialized to, uh, for um, um, adiabatic optimization, right, which is just, you know, not Shor's algorithm, right, but just sort of solving these, you know, optimization problems. In fact, you know, I've even, I've heard something that there's some company which has been trying to do this. Uh, you know, actually they've spent about $100 million so far on doing it. Uh, fortunately, you know, we don't, you know, they, they have a machine, it does work. And it does have quantum effects, at least at some level. The thing that I'd say that we don't yet know is whether the quantum effects are actually playing a causal role in solving the problems faster. Okay, so uh, you know, the I, I I think that the, what what well they're they're solving they're solving things you know that at least their special problem right their icing spin minimization with their special topology right they do you know they do do it faster than you know classical like sat solvers or whatever or apparently faster right but now uh yeah i don't remember exactly how much you know it's about it's about on 100 bits yeah right this is well this is the question right yeah right well this is right this is this well this is this is the question right if they if they'd put the same effort you know and you know into just building a classical thing would they have done it as well right and and so one of the experiments that many of us would like them to do is to you know if they could just turn up the decoherence in their device and show that the performance degrades when they do that that would be great right but you know they but unfortunately their setup is not designed for that kind of experiment they say so uh, so, so, so I think that the ball is in their court to really convincingly demonstrate this. Okay, so um, 
Okay, and then there's this uh, boson sampling, which um, Alex Arkhipov and I proposed uh, a couple years ago and related uh, restricted proposals. So um, boson sampling you know, is something uh, for when you only need your quantum computer to overthrow the extended charge Turing thesis and not to do anything useful. Okay, we've got the solution for you. Okay, so, uh, so, so the way. Yes, yeah, exactly. So far it hasn't worked, but yeah. So, uh, okay, so the way this, this, this proposal works is I actually gave a whole talk about this at MSR before, so I'll be brief. But, you know, and identical photons are generated, they're sent through a network of beam splitters, and then they're just measured at the end to see where they, they ended up. And that's the only thing you can do with this computer. Okay, very, very simple. Uh, okay, and then the result of this, um, um, you know, uh, the, the thing you'll get out at the end is just, you know, a sample from a probability distribution, right? You know, the photons will not, you know, be in quantum. They won't, you know, do, do something deterministic, right? Sometimes they'll arrive at these detectors, sometimes at those. Okay, and so you'll just get, you know, uh, a sample from a probability distribution over possible uh, detector clicks. Okay, and uh, this distribution will be very interesting. It will have the property that the probability, p sub x, of each possible outcome x of the experiment will, will, be, uh, will correspond to the permanent of some matrix, you know, uh, depending on x. Okay, so if you have n photons, this will be an n by n matrix of complex numbers. Okay, so the, so the probability, the amplitude will be the permanent, and the probability will be the absolute square of that, of that permanent. Okay, now the permanent, of course, is a famous uh, sharp p complete problem. So it's even above np complete. Okay, this was the result of, of Valiant in 1979. Okay, uh, um, now, you know, uh, to, to be clear, I'm not saying that this setup lets us actually calculate the permanent of a matrix of your choice. That would be too good to be true. Okay, that would mean we'd have a machine that would solve np complete problems and even more for us. Okay, this does something different and much less useful. Okay, this um, samples from a probability distribution, you know, that has you know, over matrices where matrices with large permanents are somewhat more likely to be sampled than matrices with small permanents. Okay, and so then what Arkhipov and I had to show was that this task, as useless as it apparently is, is nevertheless hard to simulate with a classical computer. Okay, under very plausible assumptions. Okay, so our result is basically that a classical computer cannot sample the same distribution in polynomial time unless p to the sharp p equals bpp to the np. Which, if you don't know what that means, uh, it's bad. Okay, uh, this would mean that this polynomial hierarchy would collapse. Okay, which we don't want to happen. Okay, so. Um, you know, now uh, our main conjecture is that this hardness of sampling extends even to approx an approximate or noisy classical simulation. You know, and that leads to a beautiful uh, complexity theoretic open problem. In order to understand the approximate case, what you really need to do is you have to you know, prove that it is sharp p complete to approximate the permanent, you know, even of a matrix of independent Gaussian entries. Okay, and no, you know, in, cl in classical complexity theory, no one knows how to do this yet. We can prove that it's sharp complete to approximate the permanent of an arbitrary matrix. We can prove that it's sharp complete to exactly compute the permanent of a random matrix. Okay, but to approximate the permanent of a random matrix, we don't know. Okay, but if you could prove this, then you know you would get that even an approximate uh, simulation of our experiment with realistic noise would already have this consequence of collapsing the polynomial hierarchy. Should I get some evidence of hardness? Uh, that would be great. You, ju you just, are, for our purposes, you just need evidence that the problem is not in BPP to the NP. Okay. okay. So, yeah. I these words approximate and higher probability. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. So, okay. You have to quantify those suitably. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, one over polynomial is basically the. agree with what you can measure. That's right. So, so there's a, a dialogue here, right? That you know, th this is just if, if you just want to handle like a little bit of, of noise, right? And of course, the experimentalists right now have a huge amount of noise, right? And so, you know, we hope to you know be able to eventually push our hardness results to deal with even a huge amount of noise. But right, but right now, even just to get them to handle a little bit of noise, you know, is seems to be pushing the frontiers and you know of what people can do in classical complexity theory.
right? So, so yeah, so, you know, recently uh, boson sampling was actually demonstrated with uh, three photons and, and some special examples with four photons. This was the publicity photo that they released. Of, uh, uh, this was done in University of Queensland. Uh, so I'm actually on, they were nice enough to add me to their science paper uh, doing this, you know, three, you know, they, they experimentally verified that indeed the, uh, amplitudes for three photons are given by the permanent of a three by three matrix. And, uh, and there were actually th three other groups that did it at the same time. So actually the number of experimental groups now exceeds the number of photons. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so, you know, so yeah, so they're, they're, they're just beginning to scale this to four, up to four photons. Uh, you know, they should be able to do, you know, like five or six, right? But if this could be if right, if this could be scaled to twenty or thirty photons, then pro I think at that point it would probably be solving this boson sampling problem faster than a classical simulation of itself. Okay, so that would be sort of an, an, a, a very exciting demonstration uh, to be able to do. Now, the the main engineering problem, the reason why this is hard, is that we don't have very reliable sources of single photons. Okay, we don't have source, you know, we have sources that sometimes generate a photon and sometimes not. Sometimes generate two photons, you know, right? So you need to just have your, all your sources reliably generate one photon at the same time so that then they all arrive at the detectors at the same time and so that you see all the interference that you want. Okay, that's the... Do that? Oh no, no, absolutely not. They, they, they because they, they, they only have to be there. But when I say at the same time, I just mean to within their wavelength, so that you see the interference. Okay, of course, you know, you know, there's. But the addition of that photon is in itself a quantum process. It is, but you know, I mean, I mean, we. Oh yeah, no, and, and of course it doesn't have to be perfect. It just needs to be good enough that there's a reasonable probability of getting, you know, 20 photons arriving at your detectors at the same time. So that's the goal, okay? And that's the, this is the challenge for the experimentalists, wh whether they can do this or not. All right, so my conclusion. Um, I, do, I don't know for sure that scalable quantum computing is possible. I'll be the first to admit that. But what I do know, I think, is that the popular framing of this question gets things exactly backwards. Um, believing that quantum computing can work doesn't make you this sort of starry-eyed visionary with this, you know, wild dream. It just makes you a scientific conservative. Okay, someone who believes that quantum mechanics will continue to be true. Okay, uh, you know, and, our, and that our current understanding of it is okay. Okay, doubting that quantum computing work will work can work doesn't make you a cautious realist. It makes you a scientific radical. Okay, someone who b believes that our current understanding of quantum mechanics must be dramatically wrong in some way. Okay, and I wish more people would would understand this point. Okay, so, you know, I think that the world has, you know, needs both uh, conservatives and radicals, you know, and I tend to believe quantum computing is possible but just because I have a conservative temperament. Okay, <laughs> so I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks. <laughs> sorry, sorry for going over. Well, I think you're a little generous at the end because hmm. you're doubting that quantum computing can work because if you doubt quantum mechanics at yeah. all, yeah. they just make you a nut. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> yeah, so I, so I, I use the term radical loosely here. It's <laughs> a very generous way. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you, if you believe that, that there is, you know, that, that, that quantum mechanics, can, you, know, you know, works for all existing experiments, but that, you know, there, there is, it, it is only an approximation to some deeper theory that we have yet to discover, and you don't say anything more about the deeper theory, but you know, I don't think that itself makes you a nut. No, no, no. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 From people who don't even understand the existing experiment. Yeah. I, that that does make you a nut, <laughs> or, or, or at least uninformed. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay, good. That's an excellent question. Yeah. 
billiard ball. Spin glass computing. Uh, yeah, so that, that, that's an excellent question. So, I mean, in fact, people are interested in, people were interested for a while in DNA computing, right, which is an example of this, right? People are very interested in protein folding, right, as an amazing natural computation that, you know, is quite hard to simulate with a, with a you know, a, a, a digital computer. Okay, all of these examples are what a theoretical computer scientist would regard as possibly large constant factor speed ups. Okay, so these are, you know, ways of sort of harnessing nature to do classical computation or sort of ordinary computation, but with more parallelism or with more processors, you know, sort of, you know, working in, in tandem, right? They are not ways that, you know, you could violate this extended church touring thesis, right? Because, you know, they can still be, you know, at least asymptotically, right, in the limit, you know, they can be, they can be simulated, right, and with, with, you know, an amount of resources that grows only polynomially with the size of your system, okay? So, uh, you know, I mean, you can see that clearly in the case of DNA computing, right? Uh, people wanted to use it to solve the traveling salesman problem, right? But there was an obvious scalability issue, right? That as you add, you know, more cities, right, then the number of, you know, strands of DNA that you need grows exponentially until there's not enough, you know, living matter in the world to, you know, Yes, okay, so that's an excellent question, right? So you can, you can wonder about what about finding ground states of physical systems, right, where often it's an NP-hard problem, and yet nature, you know, seems to do it very easily. Okay, there's a catch there. Let me tell you the catch. Okay, the catch is that um, if you, uh, the, basically the, the reason why nature can find ground states easily is that most of the instances sort of that arise in nature are quite special or, or easy instances, okay? So if you, you know, really took seriously that finding a ground state of like an icing spin glass is NP hard, right? And if you designed an icing spin glass such that finding its ground state would then give you a proof of the Riemann hypothesis, let's say, right? Then we, there is no reason to believe that nature would, would actually find the ground state, right? It would get stuck in, you know, a metastable, what physicists would call, you know, a metastable state, right? Right, no, it would, yeah, no, no. so, so, no, no, but th th this is actually a known experimental fact. In fact, you know, in, in, uh, like, with, with soap, with soap, with soap, with soap, with, soap, with yeah, with, uh, uh, well, oh, um, okay, well, so, so, for, first of all, I think that actually random constraint satisfaction problems are not nearly as hard as people used to think that they are. Right. Yeah. How do you yeah. possibly know that it's doing it? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. It just goes somewhere yeah. down. And it maybe, you know, it finds some low energy state, which mm -hmm. nature may be happy right. with. I don't think so, nature necessarily right. cares about trying the true minimum. Yeah. Always just a good minimum. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, in, in, in this case, you know, say, you know, we actually have sort of a theory that tells us why you shouldn't get an exponential speed up this way. Namely, you know, I could take, we, we think we understand the dynamics of the system well enough that we could just put it into a classical computer and just simulate it step by step. And that would in incur a large, you know, constant factor blow up maybe, right? Because the system has a lot of parallelism, right? But it wouldn't be an exponential blow up. The thing that's special about quantum computing, the thing that makes quantum computing different is that the only way that we know how to simulate n entangled particles is using an algorithm, you know, a classical algorithm whose complexity scales exponentially with n. Okay, and that's the, I think that that's the only example in nature that has that property. All right, yeah.